18 years ago, 24-year-old Jennifer Kessa was living her best life in Orlando, Florida. She had a well-paying job, recently got promoted, and bought herself a condo. She also had a loving partner and an even more supportive family. At that moment, it was hard to believe that anything would go wrong. However, on January 24, 2006, things went absolutely wrong. On that fateful day, Jennifer didn't resume work like she should, and nobody could get through to her. So, the company reached out to her family with the hopes of getting answers. Unfortunately, that was the beginning of years of endless questions. So, what happened to Jennifer Kesse? Jennifer Joyce Kesse, popularly known as Jen, was born on May 20th, 1981, to Joyce and Drew Kesse. Right from a young age, she was always the brightest light in the room. Her radiant smile and kind gestures would often set her apart. She was also a goal-getter who did everything to achieve whatever she dreamt of, which made her parents so proud. After graduating from Vivian Gaither High School in Tampa, Florida, Jennifer attended the University of Central Florida in Orlando, where she earned a degree in finance in 2003. Not long after, she got an incredible job at Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company in Okoe to work as a finalist. When it seemed life couldn't get any better, she met Rob. Jen and Rob Allen met in January 2005 when Rob came to Orlando with his roommate for a trade show. After the show, the guys decided to enjoy a fun single boys' night out at a bar, and there, they met Jennifer and her friends. Since Jennifer always lit up the room, Rob was immediately attracted to her. They exchanged contacts and their love blossomed from there. Rob said, You know that feeling when you don't want to get off the phone because you enjoy talking to the person so much? That's how it was with Jen. Three and four hours would pass, and we'd still be talking. Despite the distance between Faint Lauderdale, where Rob was based, and Orlando, where Jen stayed, the couple made things work. They shared similar interests and enjoyed traveling. Any free time they had was spent doing spontaneous stuff. And that's why, in January 2006, the couple took a trip to the island of St. Crix in the Caribbean. They had a splendid time, however they had to return to work, so they returned to Rob's place in Afton Lauderdale on Sunday, January 22, 2006. Due to exhaustion from the trip, Jen spent the night at Rob's and headed straight to work the next morning. Little did she know this was the last time she would spend the night with her boyfriend. On January 23, 2006, Jen left Rob's place for her job in Okoe, Florida. Nothing out of the ordinary happened as she went to work, talked to her parents, her brother Logan, whom she had a very good relationship, and Rob. She and her parents had exchanged pleasantries like they usually do because they were a close-knit family. Then she shared tales from her trip, telling them how exciting it was and how she couldn't wait to visit somewhere new. Her parents were pleased by how happy and lively she sounded, not knowing it would be the last time they would hear from her. As for her 21-year-old brother, she had discussed how she'd get a package across to him. During her vacation, Logan and his friends had gone to stay in the condo she bought just about a month ago. However, they left before she returned, and one of them forgot his cell phone. So, the call was to discuss how to ship the phone back. And the last person she spoke to that day was Rob. It was about 10 p.m. when they got on the call. The couple relieved some moments from their trip and then went on to discuss more serious stuff about their relationship. Jen wanted assurance that Rob loved her and was in for the long haul. Although that led to a bit of a disagreement, it was later resolved. They bid each other good night with the promise of reaching out the next day. But that never happened. The next morning, Rob woke up to see that he hadn't received any call or text from Jen. That was quite strange because Jen was a morning person and would always wake him by calling or texting. So as Rob rushed to work, he called but only got her voicemail. He had a meeting at 9 a.m. so he couldn't keep calling, but when it ended, he tried again. He was so worried because besides not hearing from her earlier, he wanted to tell her how the meeting went. He tried to push back the thought that something was amiss and went back to work. At Jen's place of work, they were certain something was amiss. That Tuesday morning, which was January 24, 2006, Jen also had a very important meeting at work, but she didn't show up. It was so unlike her to miss work without notifying anyone. She was so diligent and efficient that even if she was going to be five minutes late, she would have called ahead. That most likely played a part in her earning two promotions the previous year. 
So after trying her number several times and getting no response, her employer, who knew Jen's parents, decided to contact them to get answers. Both Drew and Joyce had none. Her parents, who were surprised by the news, decided to call her to find out what was wrong. They called and called, but got no response. And it was then they knew something had gone terribly wrong. Immediately, her brother was contacted to be sure if he had heard from her that day. When the answer was negative, her parents set out from their home in Bradenton, Florida, to her home in Orlando. On the way, Drew called a building manager at the condominium, where she resided, to check for her car. He reported that her black Chevy Malibu was gone. He then permitted two managers to check inside Jen's condo for anything strange or out of the ordinary. But their response showed that she had gotten ready for work, locked her door, and headed out. When the parents got to her home, they saw that there were no signs of forced entry, and everything was sparkly clean except for the bathroom and the bedroom. Jen's mother said, immaculate apartment except for the bathroom being a mess, of course, that was typical. Shower was wet, blow dryer out, clothes on her bed. Other than that, the apartment was completely normal. The only things missing were her purse, keys, cell phone, and iPod, which she always took everywhere. So it became clear that somewhere on her way to work was where things went wrong. Her father immediately alerted the Orlando Police Department and the Orange County Sheriff's Department. When the security officials arrived at the scene around noon on the day of the disappearance, their first thought was Jen was fine. They speculated that she had gone to meet her boyfriend or visit someone. But after taking a closer look at the details and trying to call her to no avail, it became clear that something was amiss. That was when the thought of her being abducted came to mind. The police then began searching for clues in her apartment when they found nothing. A search party, consisting of friends and family, was immediately organized. Rob and his mother also drove to Orlando to help with the search when they heard the news. The search party made use of cars, horses, and dogs to comb high and low, but nothing was found. Flyers were soon printed requesting answers, but it didn't amount to anything substantial. And as per protocol, the police began looking into close family and friends who interacted with her before she went missing. Her family was soon cleared. But Rob was not only a prime suspect due to his being her boyfriend, but he also happened to be the last person to talk to her. They grilled and questioned him, but he answered every single one with confidence. He also had a strong alibi for the perceived time of abduction. So he also got off the list and the police widened their scope. In the condominium where she lived, construction was still ongoing. Some of the condos next to hers were yet to be completed, so there were always construction workers around. Another thing is that many of them slept at the uncompleted condos, pending the time they would finish. These people also became suspects in the case. It was confirmed that these workers made Jen uncomfortable in the way they whistled and stared at her anytime they came in contact. Jen's mother said, There were a few times, Jen told me, that workers would just stop and stare at her. A few friends told her that if the workers started to verbally harass her to go to the manager, but thankfully it never escalated to that, or not that we know of anyway. The police questioned them to the best of their ability. However, language barriers between the foreign constructors and the police officers made it harder to get anything substantial information. While this line of questioning was going on, the case took a new turn. On January 26, 2006, a resident of the Huntington on the Green condominiums reported seeing a car that matched that of Jen in her building. The condominiums were just a mile from Jen's home, so the police knew there was a good chance it was Jen's car. And when they got there, it was indeed. The car had been parked like it belonged to one of those residing in the building. The police were glad because they thought they would find more evidence to work with. However, there was nothing in the car. No blood, no DNA, no hair samples, nothing at all. It was also discovered that no valuables were taken to show that robbery was not the motive of the case. The only evidence found was surveillance footage that showed an unidentified person walking in the parking lot around the same time. Her car was parked. The footage would have been the answer to all the questions. But it turned out to be another frustrating twist in the story. Because the camera, which was set to take pictures every three seconds, didn't capture the face or physique of the individual, the only thing that was obtained from the video after the use of video-enhancing tools from NASA and the FBI was that the suspect was within 5 feet, 3 inches, 
and 5 feet 5 inches tall. On one end, the police were trying to identify the individual in the photo and searching for other evidence. And on another end, the search parties continued their investigation. A search dog tracked a scent that led from her parked car back to her apartment complex, showing that the suspect might have returned to her apartment after the incident. That didn't really help the case. Further forensic examination of the car yielded a latent print and a small DNA fiber showing that the car had been wiped clean before being discarded. So the investigators had to go back to their first approach in searching for answers, asking questions. The police reached out to an ex-boyfriend who had tried to patch things up with Jen, but wasn't lucky enough. After extensive questioning, he was cleared because he had a strong alibi. Then they returned to interrogating the foreign construction workers at her place. When that yielded nothing tangible, her co-workers were interrogated. Her computer, which was taken for forensic examination, showed that a manager at work had made advances to her, but she declined because she was against workplace relationships. Although the conversations seen on the computer showed that the manager kept pushing for the relationship, the investigators couldn't pin her abduction on him because he had a strong alibi as well. Meeting a deadlock, the investigators and family began considering the theory that she had fallen victim to human trafficking. However, since mostly people who lived poorly were victims of trafficking, the theory was almost ruled out. In May 2007, Kess's company offered a one million reward for any information regarding her whereabouts. A July deadline was set, and a requirement was that she had to be alive. Nobody called in to claim the reward. Another reward of $5,000 was made available through Central Florida Crime Line, but the tips were not in any way helpful until the police received a particular call. In 2009, a woman who identified herself as Jen's housekeeper called in saying she knew who the person in the surveillance footage was. She initially said it was someone else, but when she took a closer look, she revealed that it was a man called Chino. At the time she called in with the tip, the police had already met Chino. Chino and his colleague Ben had been in her condo days before she went missing. She had needed some things done in her house, so she sought the services of Ben and Chico, who were handymen. The police had gotten to know about them during their initial interactions with the construction workers. Although they had been dismissed at the time, they were both not taken off the potential suspect list. So when the tip came in identifying Chino, they were almost certain he was the perpetrator. Not only because of the tip, but because he was serving time for statutory assault. All through the questioning, Chino stood his ground, saying he had nothing to do with the disappearance of Jennifer, and even agreed to take a polygraph test. On March 18, 2009, he passed the test, but the police didn't want to take him off the suspects list because they believed they had their man. However, his colleague and friend made a statement that swayed their thoughts. Since Ben and Chino were like two peas in a pod, the police decided to pick up Ben alongside Chino. He was also made to take a polygraph test after he told the police that he was in Jen's condo before she passed away. The statement was odd because it had not been established that Jen was dead yet. They only stuck on the belief that she was missing. So during the polygraph, Ben was asked again what he meant by Jennifer passing, and he explained that he just concluded that she had died because it's been so long since she went missing. He passed the polygraph, and the police had no other reason to hold him back. Chino and Ben were set free to go because they seemed to have no answers, but the investigator found it hard to believe that they were innocent. However, that was the end of that line of investigation. In 2010, with no more leads, the case was handed over to the FBI for an even more thorough scrutiny. But nothing was different. During that period, Jennifer's parents were constantly on the authorities' necks to buckle their pace, but nothing substantial resulted from that. When more years passed and there was still no answer, the parents decided to take matters into their own hands. In 2018, after 12 years of the police authorities not getting any closer to finding Jen, the Kessa family decided to take legal action. They filed a lawsuit against the Orlando police to have the case closed so that the records could be released and they could take personal steps to find Jen. It took a few months for the case to be settled, but it was. And in March 2019, all records about her case were given to the family. The lawsuit settlement also allowed the participation of the Florida Department in the investigation.
The records showed that the police had not put in the hard work they were claiming to have, and all the tips they got were not duly followed. This made them partly to blame for how long the case lasted, but the investigation team set up by Drew, her father, and his family quickly set to work to fill in the gaps. On November 8, 2019, there was another possible break in the case. The lead investigator, Mike Toretta discovered, deeply buried in the files. A tip from a woman who, in 2006, claimed she saw something strange at Lake Fisher in Orange County on the day Jen disappeared. When Toretta reached out to her, she explained that she had seen a man drive a pickup truck to the lake, take out what looked like a six to eight foot piece of rolled up carpet, and dump it in the lake. He then watched it sink. Drew's team began searching the area with their cadaver dogs, and the animals caught a whiff of something. However, a dive team that was deployed by the Orange County Sheriff's Department didn't find anything after a three-day search. Although the investigating team kept searching the area for more answers, they never found anything. Till date, Jennifer Joyce Kessa is still missing. Jennifer's family has not known a moment of peace since she went missing 18 years ago. And it's so unfortunate that someone out there knows what happened to her, but refuses to come forward to give her parents closure. Hopefully, the team of private investigators alongside the FDLE would be able to find Jen, whether dead or alive. Jen's story shows the power of love and resilience despite all odds. To Jen's family, we hope you get the answers you deserve very soon, and we pray you find peace when those answers finally come. May you continue to find strength in the fact that she really loved you, and hopefully, your love for her will be the guiding light to bring her home.